Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to make, the, um, make a few general comments before I actually begin my presentation. Um, the report, the weekly report that Jack and referred to, um, has given me an opportunity over the last five years of like introducing this report to observe what is happening elsewhere on many, many different issues. I think the one thing that's very clear is every country is facing basically the same challenges. Um, the two lectures that I'll be giving later in the week, one is on advanced care planning, so we'll go into that topic in quite a bit more depth. Uh, the other topic is, is family, uh, facilitating a family conference, which brings up the whole issue of communication. And one thing I like to, to point out um, is that it is communication that is either the strength or the weakness of any care provision, any clinical decisions that are made in discussion with family. Um, you will hear, if you have an opportunity to attend the lecture on family uh, conference, for example, you will hear me say that the quality of care is direct correlation with the quality of communication. And that's at the heart of this discussion. It's the heart, the heart of the other two lectures that I will be giving also. Um, I'll be talking primarily from the Canadian or North American experience. But as I mentioned, uh, the report that I compiled is looking at the window on what's happening elsewhere. But we've seen, uh, particularly in the last five to seven years, more discussion in the news media and in the literature about end-of-life care and all, all the different aspects of that, which is encouraging. Um, but it hasn't necessarily translated into greater public awareness or necessarily advanced best practice, um, but I think it's a transition period that we're going through. So um, people are reading more, they're hearing more, to discuss this more. And so, certainly in the area of advanced care planning. Um, in fact, in North America, particularly in the US, a tremendous emphasis is being placed on uh, making decisions in advance of serious illness. Um, one of the challenges that we have um, is still the perception of palliative care as being the beginning of the end. And we struggle with that. Because quite often in many situations, uh, once you talk about palliative care, you are indicated to both patient and family that they're on the final chapter. And many people just simply are not prepared or willing to go there just yet. So, and the other thing too, contrary to sort of wide held opinion, the word advance is actually a negative. Because again, the human nature, looking ahead to what might be, is often um, something, again, some, a place that people generally don't want to go to. So I think we've created a little bit of a dilemma for ourselves in some respects. Uh, the term palliative care is attributed to Balfour Mount, a Canadian physician, who is one of the great pioneers in our country. Uh, and it's coming back to haunt us, again, dealing with public perception. So in my other lectures, we'll be talking a lot more about uh, improving um, patient and family's understanding of end-of-life care, because we still have a significant job in terms of helping people understand what palliative care is. What is an interesting observation um, is that in the last, I, I would say, three to five years, mainstream medicine is adopting many of the principles of palliative care without using that term. They are talking about whole person care. They've actually, in a sense, stolen our language in palliative care. Um, fine, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. But it, it, we're now seeing more discussion about considering not just the patient, but also the family. Not considering just symptom and pain management, but also the holistic or the, the whole person care. So I think, I think this is actually an encouraging trend. Now, my report each week, um, 
basically is a summary of what's being published, broadcast, printed uh, in the media. It's fairly unscientific, but clearly trends do emerge. And, and this whole issue of, of withdrawal, withholding of treatment is becoming a very significant issue, but it is complicated by a number of other issues related to this. I'm going to kind of delve into that uh, uh, shortly. <coughs> Are there any chess players in the audience? <coughs> Does anyone recognize this picture? This is actually from a 1957 Swedish film, and the main character is a chess game with death. And that's exactly what it is. End of life is a chess game. And I think it's an interesting analogy. We're not sure of the outcome. We're not sure of the moves that need to be made, the decisions to be made. Uh, we're competing with reality. We're competing with the inevitable. And I think this is what clouds all of the issues in and around end-of-life care. What we've seen in recent years um, is a change in the relationship between the healthcare professional and the patient. A generation ago, certainly during my grandparents' time, when a physician advised you to undertake a certain course of treatment, recommended surgery, there really wasn't a lot of discussion. You took that advice, he was, or she was the expert, they had the knowledge, and you followed. We've moved towards patient-centered care, where suddenly there's a more collaboration between care provider and, and patient. And we've gone a little bit one step further, but now the family is, is involved. It has made the whole process considerably more complicated. So the impact of patient-centered care on patient autonomy has become <clears throat> a little bit of a complication in the decision-making process that wasn't there a generation ago. Um, added to this is the fact that we live in this incredible age of information. I, I undertook a survey uh, for the city of Hamilton in Ontario, Canada, in which I talked to about 50 founding physicians about what their sources of information were, and also what information did their patients bring to any consultation. And almost without exception, physicians found themselves challenged because, in a simple example, they would prescribe a particular medication and the patient immediately goes home onto the internet to validate <laughs> what the physician has told them. To sort of look, probe more deeply into side effects, possible side effects, alternatives, etc. And then they bring that information back to the next meeting. So it has put many family physicians kind of up on, on, on their guard to some extent, because their patients, families now have access to far more information. And they quite frequently will show up at an appointment with their family physician with a journal article <laughs> that the physician is not aware of. So, and that was one of the reasons I put together this weekly report, because it is extremely difficult to keep up with the literature. It's very hard to know, you know, from what the current thinking is. So the whole decision-making process has become an emotional minefield. Um, and as I say, this has changed the, the relationship with the physicians. Um, and as we moved on from patient-centered care to engaging the family more, particularly in end-of-life care, that has added another complication to the process. And as I've indicated, this is nowhere more obvious or evident than it is in end-of-life care, where we're facing the prospect of the death of a loved one, we're dealing with family dynamics, highly emotionally charged situations. Um, it's, it's, it's creating, as I say, an emotional kind of minefield.
I'd like to discuss a little bit about the environment in which this is all happening. Advances in medical technology. They're happening almost every week, if not every day. Um, and essentially, we can prolong life indefinitely. As a consequence of these advances, there's a very, very high expectation of what medicine can deliver. Often unrealistic. It's reinforced by the news media. The news media is a double-edged sword. It can be a means of getting information out to people. But in the delivery of that information, sometimes confusion arises around issues becomes more emotional, etc. Um, I'm a strong advocate of, 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 of the right for people to know what my concern is, is how they're told. And how the media tells uh, the situation often is, is uh, not always uh, well informed, it's often biased, uh, it's prejudiced by any, any prevailing emotions uh, of the situation. And the other issue, which is probably more evident in the US than anywhere else, is a very aggressive approach to treatment, particularly in end of life care. Uh, the system, uh, the medical system or healthcare system in the US is such that um, everything will be done that can possibly be done to sustain life. I can talk about a couple of specific examples towards the end of this presentation. And I refer you to a couple of actually excellent documentaries if you're not already familiar with them, but we'll come back, back to that. Um, but what we are seeing is a, a challenge to this. Um, because government is looking very closely at how the health system is funded. Uh, and, and it varies, of course, from one country to another. And a lot of emphasis, or attention rather, is being given to the fact that often the last three to six months of life are the most expensive in terms of uh, costs. Um, parallel with that discussion, we're seeing more um, talk about quality as opposed to quantity. And again, uh, this is happening in a number of different countries, but it, it, it is most noticeable um, in the US. So people, there's still the, the, you know, the, the argument that we should be doing everything that can possibly be done, but now we're hearing another point of view, a different perspective, um, thinking about the quality, asking the question, how do you want to die? What are your expectations? Um, and the system as such is, is, is the patient's choice. If they want to sustain treatment, whatever the cost, or whatever the implications might be, their wishes will be, will be honored. Um, interestingly enough, that in Canada, um, we've often said um, that we put quality of life ahead of quantity. Um, but we were rather unsettled by a report or a study that came out only a few months ago that indicated that in oncology, that there is still a fairly aggressive approach to it. To most health professionals, in particular doctors, doctors that death is a failure. They're trained to cure. And there's an expectation on the part of the public that there's a cure, or at least in the case of cancer of remission. Or let's keep life going as long as possible for those what might happen. And this is reinforced by, by some of the publicity that media gives. So I'm going to refer it later to a particular case uh, in, in Ontario right now um, that, that will illustrate that in a little bit more detail. Patient wishes. Um, this has, uh, is at, at, at the center of the plans care plan, exploring what the expectations and wishes are. Um, having a discussion kind of over lunch today is, um, and we'll be 
kind of exploring this more in advanced care planning in, in, in labor in a suite. Is that um, patients are being perhaps a little unrealistic, and often that's based on um, perhaps not being well informed, perhaps not being taught what the options are or what the implications might be. It keeps coming back. Every issue in palliative care, it seems, keeps coming back to communication. If you look at the literature, even though the topic of communications it seems to come up about four or five times a month in one study after another, we seem, and I say my use is in a very broad, general way, we seem still very, find communications very difficult. We actually have lost the ability to communicate, it seems. Uh, we've also lost the ability, it seems, to accept bad news. We're guided a great deal by not wishing to offend, to be politically or culturally sensitive. We've created a number of barriers, which makes it increasingly difficult to have an open and honest discussion. I mean, how many people take criticism of one of their supervisors says you've done a bad job, fix it, you know, we take things in a very personal way can't take criticism, which makes it very difficult to, uh, you know, to sort of take advice. And if you imagine in, in, in the setting of end-of-life care or in palliative care, it's that emotional minefield, so that the situation is almost ten times as, as, as difficult to, to, to negotiate on that case. And part of the high expectation of medicine is the family's reluctance or unwillingness to let go. I think one of the challenges that we have is the difficulty to accept how complex we are as people, as individuals. Um, we like things to be fairly simple. We like things to be either black or white, yes or no, right or wrong. Something like that. So we like simplicity. Now, we don't like to get into complicated discussions. Uh, so it's just magnifying the problems uh, uh, around the issue. There was a time when families had very little involvement other than to drive uh, their loved one to the doctor's appointment, wait for them and drive them home again. Um, now they're engaged much more. Um, and, and there's some interesting comparisons to be made between, um, um, say, um, Eastern and Western philosophy. Our system in North America um, is based, uh, the healthcare system rather, and the legal system are based on Western philosophy, where patient autonomy um, is, is the principle uh, around you know, decision making. Um, whereas in many other cultures, it's more collaborative, family oriented. We're seeing, interestingly, in Canada, we're seeing a major influence. It's going to have quite an impact if it hasn't already started on the healthcare system. Um, in the last uh, five to ten years, most of the new immigrants to Canada are from Asian countries. And they're bringing with them, of course, their values, their beliefs, uh, greater involvement uh, of family and decision making process. Um, give you an example of this. I was, this has gone back a couple of years now, getting my passport renewed. And ahead of me was a family from Iraq getting their passports. There was a husband, wife, and I think about six children. And the person behind the counter getting the information was directing his questions to, to the wife, and the husband was answering. And it was frustrating, you know, the, uh, the government official no end. And we're seeing this in, 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 in family practice, where, where physicians are having to take into account uh, different points of view. Because quite honestly, um, family, values, beliefs, were never really part of the equation in medicine. Um, and, and so we've added you know, several different or new dimensions to the whole situation. As a consequence of this environment, we've created all kinds of conflicting agendas. The bedside, 
We have patient versus family versus the care team. And given the, the nature of families today, much more fragmented geographically than before, um, it makes communication quite, you know, quite, quite challenging. And we see publicly, for example, a much broader focus on end of life care. As I've mentioned, we've seen more discussion, more debate around the end of life issues in the last few years than we haven't been in any time before that. And then in the shadows um, is government um, looking at um, the whole issue of healthcare. Of course, there isn't a healthcare system in the world that isn't under pressure. Um, in Canada, we have a, a universal healthcare system. We're heavily taxed, but our healthcare is part, part of the social services provided. Um, this has created an interesting situation because we have no idea, I have no idea what it costs to have my appendix cell. I have no idea what it costs to have my wife to take those 12 children. You don't see a bill. So as a consequence, we haven't had this reality check yet, and it's coming. Um, we're beginning to see already rationing, but we're just not doing it rationally. Um, and the government uh, right now does not, in our country at least, and this is probably true elsewhere, does not have the political will to take this issue on head on. But eventually, probably within the next, I'd say 10 years, they're going to have to make some drastic decisions about what can or cannot be funded. Um, and for a country like Canada, and also the true of the UK as well, with universal health care, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt very hard. Unfortunately, the kind of measures that Canada's taking right now in terms of curbing budget is affecting social services. And the people that are most vulnerable at the lower end of the social economic scale. Um, An interesting discussion that has emerged in the last year is what decisions would a doctor make if they found themselves in the same situation? There was a series of articles um, in, in the North American media about this. And the bottom line is most doctors would not make the decisions that their patients would make. Many would not even undertake chemotherapy. They would be focusing on the quality of whatever time they may have left. So as you can imagine how difficult that would be, that if in your own mind, you know, I would not do this, I would not want to sustain this treatment, I would want, not want this medication or whatever, and you're trying to support a patient or a family in the decision that they wish to make, which would be quite contrary with your own point of view. Um, there is a link, by the way, to the weekly report media watch on the center's website. So if you want to take a bit of time for those who can spare it, and you can look back over past issues. Uh, this discussion has surfaced in the last six months, and it surprisingly has generated an awful lot of uh, activity on the internet. So it's making people think, you know, doctors must not do this, or they would do this. You know, maybe I should you know, be thinking in this situation. So there's this discussion about aggressive care, there's the discussion about you know, the rising costs, how do we sustain the healthcare system? Um, and there's more discussion about the alternative to aggressive care. It's the beginning of the conversation, of a long way from, from seeing any real direct uh, impact on what is, what is happening. <coughs> The withdrawal of withholding of uh, treatment is only one of several different issues that actually makes it very, very complicated. Probably at the top of the list is pain management. Uh, the incidence of poorly treated pain is very disturbing. Very, very, various studies have indicated that up to 65 to 70% of cancer patients are not treated well for their pain. 
In Canada, this was a major issue back in the 19, late 1960s, and really was the beginning um, of a movement towards developing palliative care further. There was an expert advisory committee that looked at the possible legalization of heroin in the use of the treatment of cancer pain, which led to a discussion about physician knowledge around the whole issue of pain management, which led to the discovery we weren't doing it very well that period. Um, and it remains a, a, a key issue. Resuscitation. This is where reason and emotion come uh, into conflict. And it comes back to my earlier observation or comment about the high expectation of, of the public patients in particular. Resuscitation is not successful in a very large percentage of patients. But the public thinks of like in a different way. Largely because of the way it's presented in the media. The number of medical shows, for example, that show these heroic attempts to bring back life and they succeed, it seems, every time. Um, and this has a powerful impact. You know, you see it on TV, it's exciting, dramatic shows. You know, this person can, you know, be brought back to life. Artificial hydration and nutrition. Again, poorly misunderstood. The minute, for example, that you begin to withdraw nutrition, it's a physical sign to a lot of people, but you're giving up, you're starving, or the person will die of thirst. These are huge kind of generalizations. When you read the media, this is how it's being interpreted by a lot of people. The principle of double effect. We're getting into very gray areas here from a public perspective. Eternal sedation, for example. Um, there's still some disagreement or discussion about whether that actually pays its death. But even though it may be its primary purpose is to relieve the suffering, there is the possibility that it may pay some death. People find it hard to distinguish between that and a deliberate attempt on someone's life. Sorry, I got my own things out of order there. There's one double effect of having to change the patient. Basically, a similar comment. Medical futility, what do you mean? We, have, we are now dealing, and I'm waiting a little bit um, before getting into this in any detail, we're now dealing in Canada with several cases where physicians have decided further treatment is futile. But hold that thought because we're going to come back to it. And then, of course, the issue that we're really focusing on today. vegetative and minimally conscious state. Again, an area that the public generally is unfamiliar with, or at least unappreciative of the complexities. I'm going to be referring specifically to a case uh, in Canada right now, where this has become an issue. One thing that makes it very, very difficult to have a reasoned discussion around any of these issues is the way that it's presented by the news media. And as a consequence of their coverage of these issues, um, the, the medical profession in particular is not willing to engage the media, which is the biggest possible mistake they can make. Because until the, the, the medical professional, the health professional at large, engages with the media, we will never affect change uh, in how they perceive situations, how they report incidences, etc., etc. And assisted or facilitated death. I do not you generally use the term physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. Um, but this is the issue probably that has complicated discussion around end of life care, end of life care treatment, um, and complicated all the other issues. To the general public, there's very little difference between assisted or facilitated death and terminal sedation. Or a little difference between assisted and facilitated death 
and a withdrawal of the treatment. Um, it's all a grey area. Um, and uh, in the public mind, the end result ultimately is the death of the person. Um, interestingly, um, in Canada, the movement that is in favor of decriminalizing uh, assisted suicide has probably done more to focus attention on quality of end of life care than the palliative care movement. They see, as many of the groups now see assisted suicide as an option, along with all the other options. Um, and, as, and again, we have a we also now have a case going on in the British Columbia Superior Court about whether or not assisted suicide should be considered an option. But it's another aspect of end of life care, it's another issue in end of life care. There's only, oh, I can't move quickly now. <laughs> I just have a signal. Okay. Um, so, there, there, there persists a, a widespread lack of understanding of the complexities of end of life issues. And ethicists and, and healthcare professionals have seen a split in heads over a lot of these decisions. It goes back to my earlier comment that we would like to see things a lot simpler, a clear explanation. But we've seen, uh, not just in North America, but in many European countries, Australia included, that there is a, in the public mind at least, a correlation between withholding life-sustaining treatment and assisting a facilitated death. Maybe we can hold this discussion for the question period or the workshops. This is uh, Palliative Care 101, okay? It's a quick restating of what it is that we believe in from a palliative care perspective. Focuses on the quality of life, alleviating suffering, comfort not cure, respect for individuals' beliefs and values, allowing patients to weigh the risks and benefits of intervention and treatment. It's a reintroduction to the concept of slow medicine, backing off to reassess the situation respecting the patient's wishes to maintain life or refusing life to save this treatment. But it regularly puts the healthcare professional um, between a rock and a hard place. Access to palliative care, however, remains limited in most countries. In Canada, for example, only about 30% of Canadians have access to palliative care. Care, and about 75% of people still die in hospitals. So uh, that's pretty consistent with, with, with many other countries. Okay, I'm going to put these points up on the screen right now and maybe introduce them into the workshops or at least into some of the discussion later on in the interest of time. But certainly in the US, there has been a lot of discussion about. Um, conscience as a conscience, and in some uh, states, legislating you know, physicians, for example, must not be influenced by their own moral beliefs. They have an obligation, no matter what, to provide the care. We've had half a dozen cases in the last couple of years in Canada which has focused attention on this issue. This is the one that probably has had the most publicity and interest in one that was developed. This was a case of a family and patient who had expressed wishes to sustain life based on their, their personal and religious beliefs. The physician refused. The family took the matter to the courts. The courts turned it over to what we have in Ontario called the Consent and Capacity Board, which is intended to be independent arbitration of these kinds of situations. The doctors refused, took it to the lower court, courts in, in Ontario, who turned it back uh, to the Consent and Capacity Board. And the physicians took it to the Supreme Court, and on Friday last week, the Supreme Court 
role that they will hear the case. This is going to have incredible implications because basically what will be decided is who has the final authority. Um, it's hard to know what the outcome will be, but it will have huge implications. Let me put one to you. Does this mean advanced care plans will not have any value? If an advanced care plan or advanced directive states sustain life, could this decision by the you know, Supreme Court give the authority of the final say to the physicians? We have a similar case going on in the British uh, Columbia courts right now of whether or not assisted suicide should be considered a treatment option. Quebec province of Quebec advocates for this. So we have two court cases which will be many, many months away from resolution. It will make a huge impact on the whole decision making process. Another recent case involved the Ontario Consent Capacity Board in which a hospital in Ontario, again, against the families and the patients' wishes, wanted to you know, cease treatment. It was taken to the board and they ordered that the physician had to follow uh, the family's wishes. This is another case. Why I bring these particular ones up is the publicity that surrounded them was, was national in scope. In fact, it attracted a lot of international press. And it raised more questions than uh, gave any kinds of answers. But there were challenges to the medical system. There were challenges to the authority of physicians. Um, and in this particular case, the first case, um, the patient was in um, vegetative state and temporarily came out of it last two weeks ago and made some physical gestures. So whatever the ruling is um, um, in the Supreme Court will not affect this particular patient because it's not showing some signs uh, being able to, to make some simple gestures and such. Nonetheless the case will have significant implications. I'm not going to dwell on these but We've had all these cases, one from October 2010, another one about a month earlier, which again focused on the, the, the conflict that prevails often between patients, families, and healthcare providers. Um, so the two cases that I refer to have now enormous implications in terms of where the authority finally rests. This is a case Again, similar, in which an 84-year-old uh, Jewish uh, man, again, uh, because of his personal beliefs, his, his faith, um, required or, or wished that he, his life would be sustained. Uh, two physicians, attending physicians, uh, resigned from the hospital over this issue because they felt the treatment was too time. It went to the courts. The gentleman died before the court. So, you know, we, we never saw any kind of outcome to that. In terms of the American perspective, I'm going to refer you to these two documentaries. If you're not already familiar with them, it will give you uh, a very interesting perspective uh, on the whole issue of aggressive care at the end of life um, and the challenges it is um, to the healthcare system. Um, in the context of the quality of end of life care, but also in the context of the cost, the financial cost of the healthcare system.